Great to see everybody today. Welcome to Park Road Presbyterian Church. Uh, we hope you have a bulletin. You'll need one to sing along with the songs today. So if you didn't get one, make your way back real quick and pick one up in the back. In that bulletin, you'll find a little slip of paper that says keeping in touch. And if you'd like to sign up for anything or let us know that you're interested in something, the way to do that is on that slip of paper. And then you can drop it in the uh, boxes that are on the kiosk in the back. Also, if you'd like to give to the church, you can give through those boxes uh, by a check or you can do that online and uh, you'll find more about that in the bulletin. Uh, on page 11 is the calendar for the week and uh, you'll notice all the things that are happening. Under that, it says, are you anxious? That's about our anxiety support group. I noticed as I read that blurb, it doesn't say when it's going to meet, which frankly made me very anxious. And so um, uh, let me just tell you, it meets every Monday. Think of Manic Monday. Uh, every Manic Monday, that group meets for an hour just to share and support one another. So you can learn more about it there in the bulletin. And notice in the calendar of the week, it does say at Monday, 6 p.m. The great family dinner is coming up. It's a way to get our uh, families with children together and support one another, kind of celebrate what God is doing here. And that's coming up on Tuesday, January 10th. That's uh, this coming Tuesday. The SALT group, that's our senior adults group, are celebrating all their birthdays at one time at the beginning of the year because they're senior adults and they don't know if they're going to be around by the end of the year. No, no. It's, it's brutal. It's ugly. Sorry. Anyway, they're going to have that celebration. I'm sure they're going to be very long-lived individuals, so please be a part of that. Uh, snail mail on page 13 is a way of uh, keeping in touch with those who are in the military and who are missionaries, people at college. Uh, learn more about that by uh, attending that information meeting coming up on January 21st. Uh, dinner groups are coming up, and what we're going to be doing is uh, we've contacted a lot of people in the church to see if they would be willing to host one dinner. About 12 people will gather, and then others will volunteer to host one dinner. So nine times a year, we'll get together with the same group for dinner, and uh, you'll hear more about this. We'll explain it little by little as we get closer for toward the launch. Uh, the annual camping trip is coming up. You'll see it at the bottom of page 13. Uh, if you're into camping, that's February 24th through 26th. Lastly, on the back cover, you'll see this QR code. And if you haven't downloaded the uh, Park Road app, you can do that on your phone. All the sermons are there, lots of other resources. You can use this app to uh, commend the church to other people so that other people can know what's going on here and perhaps come and worship with us. So download that. Let me remind you again, please fill out that slip of paper and drop it in the box uh, later on just so that we know that you were here and anything that you're interested in, you can indicate that on that form. We have just completed a, kind of a milestone uh, event in our church's history. That is the uh, graduation of a new class of inquirers who are going to be coming into the life of the church through membership vows today. So if you're in that group, would you please stand right now and come on to the front? And I'll just wait for you to get here. All right, look at all these folks. Really grateful, and I hope everyone uh, in this group has you know, been rehearsing this song that we're gonna sing for the <laughs> congregation. All right, so come on up. And I'll uh, introduce you. You can spread right across here. I'll get. I'll come all the way on this side. All right. I'll try to get over here so I'm out of your way. Uh, all the way on this side is Pansy Carey, and uh, Pansy is sister-in-law to Wayne and Angie, and married to Carl, and um, Pansy, uh, sorry Pansy, uh, Pansy is a faithful mom of 
two, a grandma of three. Wayne told me she loves kickboxing. So, you know, don't mess with her. And, and, um, and she loves nice shoes. And look, she's wearing very beautiful shoes today. Uh, Pansy, this is a, a verse that I chose for you for as you come into the membership of the church from the 17th Psalm. Keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. Next is Brittany. Brittany Brooks. And um, Brittany is an attorney. And I have, we have a mutual friend. And I asked the friend to fill in some blanks. And she said, she described Brittany as very smart, very kind and loving. And I thought to myself, I do not want to be friends with her. No, 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 of course I do. And we are, and, and we hope we'll, we'll we, yes, just, uh, Brittany, this is a verse I chose for you from the book of Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount, having to do with your profession. Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets, but I came to fulfill it. Uh, next are uh, the Alvarados and Lewis and Carol. And uh, Lewis uh, and Carol have two adult children who I met, Hannah and Daniel. Is that right? All right. And um, they enjoy watching Netflix together, and just like my wife and I do. And this is a verse that I chose for you. I know that. Um, Coming to this church has been kind of an oasis for you and a, a search that's been long in the coming. So the verse that come, came to my mind was from the 23rd Psalm. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Next is Karen, uh, Karen Caldwell. She's a recently retired rheumatologist. That's a person who studies rumors and uh, <laughs> And um, she just moved uh, back to this area a year ago. She's an adventurer, and uh, she shared some stories with me. So uh, pick her brain a little bit. She has a fantastic life story to tell. And Karen, I thought of this verse uh, because of your love for Malaysia and far-flung islands from Isaiah 42. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing his praise from the end of the earth. You who go down to the sea and all that is in it, you islands and those who dwell on them. Next is uh, the little Ryle family. And uh, Chris is a firefighter. And Laura is a nurse who stays very busy nursing her anxious and rambunctious boys. So that's fantastic. And Lucas, raise your hand, Lucas. Uh, Lucas has come through the inquirer's class. Let me use this as an opportunity to say, if you're a parent in this church and have children and wonder uh, how do they, uh, how are they brought into the communing membership, you just simply go through the inquirer's class again with your children, and we provide some materials that help you walk them through the process. So Lucas uh, and Nicholas are examples of people who have uh, just gone through the class. Now, for the larger Ryle family, this is a verse I chose from you for the, from the 144th Psalm. May our sons flourish in their youth like well-nurtured plants. May our daughters be like graceful pillars carved to beautify a palace. I know you don't have any daughters, but you never know. <laughs> and then for you, Lucas, this verse from 1 Timothy chapter 4. Let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourself an example of those who believe. Next is Nicholas, and uh, Nicholas is famous for a number of different things. And uh, his favorite neighbor is, who is it, Nicholas? Me, thank you. Yeah, he's, uh, he lives right behind us with his family, uh, the Menendez family, uh, right behind us in the alley. He's 10 years old, likes to play video games. And again, the parents accompanied him through the inquirer's class, and he's my favorite neighbor. Well, his whole family. Here's a verse for you, Nicholas, from Romans chapter 8. But in all these things, 
we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. Do you know what Nicholas means? Conqueror. There you go. Lastly, uh, the Moniz family and... Um, let me see, I know, you're, I know you're here somewhere, Moniz family. Uh, Joe and Carolyn, uh, they're retired. They have uh, from Motorola. They both worked for Motorola for many years. Some of you know people who have worked there. And they um, are retired. They have seven children and lots of grandchildren and seven great-grandchildren. Is that right, Joe and Carolyn? Thirteen. Thirteen now. Okay, so there. One was born yesterday. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise the Lord, the Lord and giver of life. And this is a verse for you from the 119th Psalm. Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Uh, I'm going to give you guys now the vows of membership. And those of you who have taken the class can respond in the affirmative. We hope that you'll do that. Do you acknowledge yourselves to be sinners in the sight of God, justly deserving his displeasure and without hope, except in his sovereign mercy. Do you? Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the son of God and savior of sinners? And do you receive and rest upon him alone for salvation as he is offered in the gospel? Do you? Do you now resolve and promise in humble reliance upon the grace of the Holy Spirit that you will endeavor to live as becomes the followers of Christ? Do you? Do you promise to support the church in its worship and work to the best of your ability? Do you? Do you submit yourselves to the government and discipline of the church and promise to promote its purity and peace? Do you? And do you agree that if at any time you consider no longer attending St. Andrew's Park Road Presbyterian Church, that you will make an appointment with an elder or pastor to discuss this decision? Do you? Let me pray for you. Father, we're grateful that you serve us as the master of ceremonies and you choose our family for us and you have decided in your sovereign goodness to bring us together as members of the same body. And so we pray that this body would now open up to receive these as it were organ transplants and that they would thrive in this body and would come into their own spiritually, that they would mature and uh, know all the blessings that are theirs in Christ, that they would learn from the congregation and also be able to teach the congregation through the gifts that you've given to them. Bless their lives, Father, and bless us as we try uh, to function together. Uh, many different people from many different walks of life join together like spokes to a hub, uh, trusted, trusting in and connected to Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, be glorified as you reign over this congregation. Amen. Let's welcome them into the church. My lovely assistant has the home version of the Park Road game to give you, and you can take that and play it at home. Would you turn now in the bulletin, please, to page one at the bottom, you'll see this quotation from the 35th Psalm. Listen now to these words as God uses them to draw us into his presence. Contend, O Lord, with those who contend with me. Fight against those who fight against me. Take hold of buckler and shield and rise up for my help. Draw also the spear and the battle axe to meet those who pursue me. Say to my soul, I am your salvation. Let's pray together. Father, we ask now that you would show yourself to be our defenders. Lord Jesus Christ, 
show yourself to be the lion who comes to conquer on our behalf and the lamb who comes to give himself for us. And spirit of the living God, empower us now to sing the praises of God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and worship God. Tell the same old lies If you're trying to fill the same old holes inside There's a better life There's a better life If you got pain He's a pain to 
Search for the light of day in the dead of night And we've all found ourselves worn out by the same old fire We've all run to things we know just ain't right When there's a better life There's a better life, yes If you got pain, he's a pain taker He's a chain breaker If you believe it If you receive it If you can feel it Somebody testify If you believe it If you receive it If you can feel it Somebody testify If you got pain He's a pain taker If you feel lost He's a way maker If you need freedom Or saving He's a prison shaking savior If you got chains He's a chain breaker Please be seated Come now to the time where we go to this chain breaker with our prayers. And you can find the words we will be praying on page four in your bulletin or on the screen behind me. We will first go to God with a prayer of confession, receive assurance of pardon, and then go to prayers to him with prayers of gratitude and the requests of our hearts. So would you pray first out loud with me and then we'll have a moment of silent confession. Let's pray together. Gracious God, our sins are too heavy to shoulder, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. We confess what our lips tremble to name, what our hearts can no longer carry, and what has become for us an unbearable fire of guilt and shame. Set us free from a past that we cannot change. Open to us a future in which we can be changed. Grant us grace to grow more and more into the likeness and image of our older brother. We pray this in his name, in the name of Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Amen. Let's pause for a moment of silent confession. For those who are believing in the good news, of Jesus Christ, hear this assurance of pardon and new grace from Romans chapter 8. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Jesus Christ is he who died, yes, rather, who was raised, and who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Our Father, Thank you for justifying us by the perfect life, sacrificial death, and victorious resurrection of your beloved Son. Help us to hide behind his works and not our own. Lord Jesus Christ, 
Thank you for interceding for us. Teach us to pray along with you. Lord, teach us to pray. Holy Spirit, as your priestly people, we intercede now praying for those who are in great need of your grace, guidance, and healing. Triune God, Empower your servants, Fred and Sheila Reed, to love you and to serve you faithfully in the city of Tokyo. Father, if it is true that you alone are the one who justifies, help our hearts to truly believe that there is no one who can condemn in Jesus Christ. Lord, if it is you who has truly been raised, give us a hope to know that one day we will too. Would it stir in us a life of interceding as you have interceded and continue to intercede for us. Would you help us by your grace, your guidance and your healing in our lives to love those who are around us, to be a light in this dark place, show us what that even means and looks like this very day and do this ultimately, not so that we prove anything or that we look some type of way but ultimately for your glory and our good, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. You can turn to page five or look at the screen behind me now as we have an opportunity to declare our faith together. And I ask now, if able, that you stand as we declare this faith coming from the Apostles' Creed. Christian, what do you believe I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Father and waiting for my time 
I've come here with a mission And soon I'll give my life for this world I'm praying in the garden And I'm looking for a miracle I find the journey hard but It's the reason I was born Can this cup be passed on? Lord I pray your will in this world, yeah So I'll carry my cross And I'll carry this shame To the end of the road To the struggle and pain And I'll do it for love No, it won't be in vain Yes, I'll carry my cross And I'll carry the shame Come for me now Even though I've done no wrong Father, please forgive them They know not what they've done In this world So I'll carry my cross And I'll carry the shame To the end of the road Through the struggle and pain And I'll do it for love no, it won't be in vain Yes, I carry my cross And I carry the shame Three more days and I'll be coming back again Three more days and I'll be coming back again Three more days and I'll be coming back again Days and I'll be coming back again So I'll carry my cross And I'll carry the shame To the end of the road Through the struggle and pain And I'll do it for love No, it won't be in vain Yes, I'll carry my cross And I'll carry the shame Yes, I'll carry the shame. Amen. <clears throat> Good morning to you all. Good to be with you today. Uh, we have children's church this morning, and so I'm going to uh, dismiss our kids. If you have uh, kindergarten through fifth grade and would like to have them go to children's church, you can do that uh, and go to the back as I pray. And for everyone else, if you turn to page eight in your bulletin, one uh, last announcement to uh, our anxiety support group that TJ mentioned is actually meeting at 7 p.m., not 6 p.m., which he just gave you more anxiety by giving you the wrong time. 7 p.m. on Mondays, uh, so just make that note. Let me pray, and then our kids can be dismissed. Father in heaven, we give you thanks that you, Lord, are the giver of life, and you uh, have invited us into life with you um, to be a part of your family. And Lord, we pray that uh, our kids, as they hear the gospel this morning, would you impress upon their hearts uh, what it means to believe in you, uh, that you are who you say you are, and would you do the same for us, and may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts together this morning be pleasing to you, our Lord and our Redeemer, amen. Kids, you can be dismissed, make your way to the back there, see Miss Alexa. <clears throat> for everyone else, would you turn to page 8 or follow along on the screen, this morning I'm going to be reading from Matthew chapter 11. <clears throat> when Jesus finish, had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in their cities. Now when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, 
Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. And the dead are raised up. And the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears, let him hear. Let him hear. But to what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their playmates. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by her deeds." Verse 25, at that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lonely in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. The word of the Lord. <clears throat> well, we have now uh, entered into... A season of the year where we focus our attention on Jesus Christ, his life and ministry, his passion, death, and his resurrection. And here at Park Road, we call this the season of the sun, which is followed by the season of the spirit as we head into after uh, the Easter season and into the season of Pentecost. The passage we're looking at this morning from the Gospel of Matthew leads us to consider the claims of Jesus. And there are a number of interactions in this passage here that present opportunities for Jesus to make claims about who he truly is and what he has come to earth to do. And I think it might be a fitting thing to consider in the beginning of a new year here in 2023. We're really doing it, 2023. Another year into the 21st century, how are we as modern people to consider the claims of Jesus? And what's intriguing about this bit of Matthew's gospel is that the questions that are coming to Jesus about who he is are coming from different places. And one, as we're going to see in just a moment, from a very unexpected place and person. But I think it's obvious to most of us, I think we interact uh, kind of in the same circles, but in our modern world in 2023, um, people are constantly raising questions about faith and religion, 
about who Jesus is and what he is all about. These questions are always swirling in our society. You may have heard this term used before, but we live in a pluralistic society, which simply means that there are many competing ideas and beliefs at work in public life. And so the person of Jesus then becomes part of that pluralistic dynamic in the world, which means this, that there are those in the world who accept the claims of Jesus, who he says he is, what he says about himself. There are those who do not accept these claims and reject what is on offer with Jesus. Or, and I think this is perhaps becoming more and more of a segment of people in 2023, there are those who do not know the claims of Jesus, who he is and what he says about himself either through being disconnected from religious life or the church growing up or perhaps growing up in a different religion or spirituality or I think particularly present perhaps in our more affluent national context in the United States, simply indifferent or unbothered by the claims of Jesus. And so today, I want us to look at three points that really introduce us to the claims of Jesus and what I would say also present the grounds for accepting Jesus for who he says he is. So first, I want us to look at promises fulfilled. Second, the unimpressed and uncommitted. And third, the claim and the invitation. Promises fulfilled, what I'm calling the unimpressed and uncommitted, and third, the claim and the invitation. Matthew 11 begins with Jesus surrounded by his disciples. They've been going on kind of this preaching tour, going in different cities. And then we're told that some of John the Baptist's disciples seek out Jesus, they come to him. Remember, Jesus, uh, John the Baptist is Jesus' cousin. He sends his followers to Jesus with a specific mission and question to ask Jesus, are you the one we've been waiting for? Or do I need to look for another? Now, let's pause there and really think about that. This is John the Baptist who was asking this question. The prophet in the wilderness preaching about repentance and faith to the wayward people of Israel who told of God's coming lamb, the Messiah, who as the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi promised, was to be like Elijah to come before the Messiah. But John now is in prison. He's in real trouble, like real life trouble. In other places in the Gospels, we're told that John had rebuked Herod, the ruler, because of his adulterous life, where he took the wife of his brother for himself, and John spoke out against that, and Herod had John thrown in prison, and we know also ultimately beheaded for that. But now John is in prison, and you can imagine questions and doubts start to swirl in this desperate situation, right? It's what happens often in suffering or in desperate situations. Questions start to swirl in our minds so much so that it leads John to send his own followers to Jesus to ask him, hey, listen, are you actually the one or do I need to look for another? Now, this type of question about who Jesus is, again, I don't want it to be lost on us comes from John the Baptist himself. He has doubts. John the Baptist. Why? Well, perhaps even for John, the way that Jesus was going about his life and ministry was different than what he had expected. It led him to inquire, should I be looking for another one? Or are you really it? 
But let's look at how Jesus responds. And I love this. I think it is so telling and compassionate. Gives us another window into Jesus. He doesn't get defensive. He's not offended or feeling betrayed by his cousin's questioning of him. Doubts and questions swirl in our suffering, and John is clearly in that kind of situation. But Jesus says to John's followers, have a look around. The blind see, the deaf hear, the lepers are cleansed, and the poor, the poor are having the good news preached to them. See, Jesus is reminding John of the promises of the scriptures, the promises of the Hebrew prophets, and in particular, this great messianic promise in Isaiah chapter 61, that those things would happen, that the blind would see, the deaf would hear, and the good news of the gospel would be preached to the poor. Jesus tells John, my brother, Look around, the scriptures are being fulfilled in front of you. See the mighty works of God that are being done. And what I really love about this is that after John, Jesus replies to John's disciples, he then turns to the crowd and the leaders that are there and he lifts John up. He praises John and he gets after the crowd and at the same time, even tells them that as great as John was, greatness is not what defines you in the kingdom of God. Look at verse 11. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. What a statement that is. But then, yet, the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Jesus makes the claim, he is the one that the Hebrew scriptures have promised is coming. He is the Messiah, the rescuer, the bringer of good news for the poor. All of that is fulfilled in him. John, you can rest easy. Your doubts can be laid down at the feet of the scriptures that are being fulfilled in me. Now, as modern day people, looking to the Bible, for many people, uh, to the scriptures to prove the claims of Jesus is an unacceptable source. Uh, or it's an inaccessible source in that many people are just unfamiliar with the Bible or do not trust the Bible in general. And so what is our response to that for people who are perhaps coming to the questions of Jesus from that perspective. Well, I want to encourage us to think of it in this way. We go back to Jesus himself. We do what John does when people are living with doubts and skepticism in their questions. We go to Jesus and hear the claims that he is making about himself. We take the doubts and the skepticism to Jesus like John did. He can handle it. He's the Messiah. And not only this, but what Jesus does in this interaction where he hears John's doubts he once again flips the world's understanding of what he has come to do. It's not about the greatness of John the Baptist, Jesus says. It is about the least in my kingdom. For the least is even greater than John himself. You see, ultimately the claims of Jesus bring us back to the most humble of points, that the kingdom of God is open not to the great, not to the recognizable, but open to those who see themselves as the receivers of good news for the poor. Those that receive that good news. But second, on the other hand, there is another response Jesus gives in this passage about his claims, and it's where he directly takes on what I would call the unimpressed and the uncommitted. 
After Jesus speaks about John and he praises him and he lifts him up, he turns to the crowd and the leaders that are there and he takes them dead on. Verse 16, he says, to what shall I compare this generation? It's like children sitting in marketplaces and calling to their playmates. We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. And then he goes on to say, you went out to the desert to see John not because you were interested in repentance and faith, not because you were attracted to his message. You went out there to see him because you wanted to see the freak show. You wanted to see the crazed man who wore the weird clothes and ate the honey and the locusts. And now you come to me, the son of man, accusing me of being a drunk and a glutton. You are here for the show. You are interested in the miracles and clamor for more and more. And then we didn't read this part. He zeroes in on three little towns around his hometown, Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum. And he takes them dead on and says, you have seen all of these miracles. You have seen all of these mighty things of God. And yet you do not believe and you clamor for more. And he doubles down and he says, if these same things had been done in Sodom, that Old Testament place that was synonymous with immorality and sin, if they had been done there, they would have believed and that place would still be standing. Verse 24, but I tell you that it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. You see, the people in these places were witnessing the mighty works of Jesus. They were hearing the message of the good news for the poor. And yet seemingly they were unimpressed, unmoved. I mean, maybe it led some people to talk about what was happening, but it didn't move them to believe. And in fact, it moved the Pharisees and the leaders to actually strike out against Jesus and call him as they did with John the Baptist, a being of the devil. In other words, and this is something that I really love, the Bible commentator Michael Green says, he says, signs of God's power in the miraculous are veiled signs. They can warrant belief, but never compel it. You get that? Signs in the miraculous. These miraculous signs are veiled signs. They can warrant belief, but they cannot compel it. You can see it and still not believe. Perhaps you even try and explain it away, or you demand to see more. And I actually think this is another characteristic of our modern world. When we think about the claims of Christ. Some may say, and maybe I've said this before, maybe you've said this before, you know, if I could just see some of these miracles, you know, if Jesus would, if God would just do some of this now in front of me, then I, I would believe. I would give my life. If it was given to me in this more provable, miraculous way, then yes, I would accept Jesus for who he is. And my response to that is, I think in actuality, our human tendency is to be unmoved. To be fairly unimpressed by the works and miracles of Jesus. And ultimately, many people, because they are simply unimpressed, they remain uncommitted. Not yet compelled to believe that Jesus was God in the flesh. And so we remain uncommitted. And this seems to be kind of a growing trend in our society and in our day. This indifference to Jesus, this malaise that kind of whole, hangs over us. And so even though Jesus' claims speak to our doubts, point us to the promises that are fulfilled in the scripture, there are still those that will remain unimpressed, unconvinced, uncommitted, or even reject what is on offer with Jesus. But what is on offer? What is this claim and invitation that Jesus makes? 
The passage moves, and in this moment, Jesus turns to his father and says this, Father, I am so thankful that you have hidden these things from the wise and given them to little children. Now remember, that's the second time here that Jesus has said that his claims turn upside down what the world expects. First, it was this idea of greatness. You have to be great like John the Baptist that makes a difference in my kingdom. And instead he says, no, it's being the least in the kingdom of God, which is what I am about. And here he says, it is not about the wise, but these things have been given to little children. And then he gives this power-packed description of his relationship with his father. And he makes five, count them, five massive claims about who he is in verses 25 and 27. Let me just run through them real quickly. Number one, Jesus maintains that God the Father conceals and reveals according to his will. Meaning, whoever comes to believe, it has happened because of God's divine self-disclosure. God has brought about that belief nothing else. Second, Jesus claims to be the perfect representative of the Father. Third, only the Father fully understands Jesus. And vice versa, number four, only Jesus understands the Father. And then lastly, Jesus says, only he, the Son, can reveal the Father. If you want to get through to God, come to Jesus. Verse 27, No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son who chooses to reveal him. This is the claim. Jesus of Nazareth is claiming that he is the revelation of God, that he is God in the flesh. And so we often wonder, people ask, what does God look like? How does God show himself to the world? What does God look like? He looks like Jesus of Nazareth. This is what he is claiming. He is the promises of the Old Testament fulfilled. He is the outworking of God's wonders and signs in the world. And here he claims also that all things in creation have been given to him. Even you and me. His claim is that only, all of that only happens through him. Only through Jesus can God be made known to people. Now, this is the claim of Jesus. This is what he is saying about himself. And of course, this is what makes Christianity and its message so polarizing. And in 2023, perhaps more polarizing than ever before. But today, if you're here and you have these types of questions or these doubts, or you know people in your life who are wrestling with skepticism about the claims of Jesus, if we are to be truly intellectually honest, if you are going to give Jesus a fair shot and hear him out, you will be forced to move in one direction or another. There is no option for the middle ground with Jesus. Why? Because he doesn't give us the middle ground. What he says about himself does not give or afford middle ground. And yet it seems today for so many of us and so many in our community that we are like Bethsaida and Capernaum. We're unimpressed. We're uncommitted. But here is where the unexpected invitation of Jesus comes. You would think that Jesus, after dealing with John's questions and then getting worked up about all of these people who have seen his miracles and heard his message that don't believe, that Jesus would speak further judgment out of frustration and anger. But that would not be Jesus. These next few verses are some of the most quoted precious words of Jesus. Verse 28. Come to me, 
all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lonely in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, one observation, and then I want us to really think about this invitation. These words, these very tender, soft, compassionate words, again, remember, come from the one who one sentence earlier claimed to be God in the flesh who has been given all things. The one who spoke with such strength towards those who are unimpressed and uncommitted, who saw but didn't believe, the one who spoke so confidently with such composure to John's questions now speaks with such tenderness and extends an invitation that is as staggering as the claim that he is God. He says, come, just come, all of you. Those of you who are weary, who are frayed at the edges, come and I will give you rest, not like a temporary rest or a break or a holiday, like real lasting, life-changing rest for yourselves, your body and your mind, your emotions, your muscles, everything. And what I want us to think about in the beginning of this new year is don't we need that rest? Isn't that what we are looking for and longing for? Because what the world seems to promise doesn't seem to deliver that kind of rest. Perhaps my favorite book, definitely my favorite novel, is written by the Christian agrarian writer Wendell Berry. It's called Jaber Crow. And in it, the lead character, Jaber, who lives on a riverbank in rural Kentucky, describes these words about the world's pursuit of rest. He says, it might seem to you that living in the woods on a riverbank would remove you from the modern world, but not if the river is navigable as ours is. On pretty weekends in the summer, this riverbank is the very verge of the modern world. It is a seat in the front row, you might say. On these weekends, the river is disquieted from morning to night by people resting from their work. This resting involves traveling at a great speed, first on the road and then on the river. The people are in an emergency to relax. They long for the peace and quiet of the great outdoors. Their eyes are hungry for the scenes of nature. They go very fast in their boats. They stir the river like a spoon in a cup of coffee. They play their radios loud enough to hear above the noise of their motors. They look neither left nor right. They don't slow down or maybe even see an old man in a rowboat raising his lines. I watch and I wonder and I think. I think of the old slavery and of the way the economy has now improved upon it. The new slavery has improved upon the old by giving the new slaves the illusion that they are free. The economy does not take people's freedom by force, which would be against its principles, of course, for it is very humane. It buys their freedom, pays for it, and then persuades its money back again with shoddy goods and the promise of freedom. You see, this is the modern world, what he's describing. The promises of freedom, and yet... They are hollow. They do not deliver, and we all feel it. We all wrestle with those desires for all of these freedoms. And yet Jesus says, my yoke, my way, myself in you is easy and light. So the invitation is not to be great like John the Baptist The invitation is not to be wise, but to be like little children. The invitation is to rest 
and the reward is Jesus himself. This is the good news of Jesus Christ. God in you, making all things new, pointing us to a day when he will make all things new in his entire creation. Why? Because he has claimed that for himself, that he holds all things, including you, in his hands. The invitation is not to work, but to rest. The yoke is a yoke of love, not duty. It is the yoke of the liberated, not the burden of duty or work. And if you're struggling with this this morning, the, the claims of Jesus, if you've been in a season when doubts have seemingly overwhelmed you, or you have people in your life who are in that space, this is who Jesus claims to be and what he offers. If you followed Jesus for many years, this is also the good news for you today in the midst of a world that continually entices you with lesser freedoms. And it's the message that your friends and neighbors are dying to hear, even if they seem unimpressed. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you that today we can confront you in the flesh in Jesus Christ and hear you make your claims. Thank you also, Lord, that you have provided us the grounds in which we can accept those claims, that you are who you say you are, that you are doing a work in and through us, that we are called and brought into this changing and transforming work that you are doing in the world because you hold all things in your hands and you simply call us to come. That's it. Lord, may we heed that call. May you place your yoke of liberation on us, your yoke of love, and may it lead us to respond in faith. For those that may be here that do not believe, I pray that you would open their hearts to see that for the first time. For those of us who have been struggling and wrestling with doubts, would you by your spirit free us up to see your claims anew again? And Lord, would you send us out as your people into the world to carry this message to say, come, come, rest, my yoke is easy and light. Lord, we carry that message into the world. We thank you that you have called us to do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite you to rise and sing with us as we close this morning.
today. Uh, if you would like to pray with someone, we always want to remind you that that is available to you. You can make your way to the front and we'll have men and women who are available to pray with you. Uh, also, I just want to encourage you to get to know some of our new members. You'll see them with a little manila folder. Uh, if you would go up to them and just welcome them and congratulate them and look forward to doing life together. Would you hear these words though as we're sent out? into the world with this unique life and unique message. Let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts and let us be thankful that whatever we do in thought, word, or in deed, we do it all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. 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 Thank you. 